calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen light renew. Welcome to the Troubadour Podcast. Today we are going to be reading two poems by William Blake, the songs of experience introduction and earth's answer. Now, if you have not been following along, that's fine, but we have been covering the songs of innocence and experience, showing the two contrary states of the human soul by William Blake. Songs of Innocence was published in 1789 initially, and then Songs of Experience were published in 1794, and they were combined in 1794 for the, to become the Songs of Innocence and Experience, probably William Blake's most well-known work. Now, the subtitle is showing the two contrary states of the human soul, and that's important. But um, because you, first you have to ask, what are the two contrary states? States and how does he show them? You know, what does he think they are and how does he show them and why are they contradictory? And we kind of get a view of his philosophy that as humans, we all have these states, innocence and experience, and they're there from the very beginning. So there's, there's an element of experience that's there from the very beginning. That's not there later. William Wordsworth had a very different view. His view was that there is a sense, a loss of innocence, and you're recompensed by what he calls the philosophical mind. So you have a kind of maturation process, and at some point you become experienced, and you're no longer innocent. Now, that's not to say in, in uh, Wordsworth there's no such thing as ever having innocent innocence you know, later in life or anything, but for the most part, he doesn't believe that as much as Blake does. Blake believes these contrary states are battling it out it's a dialectic process, if you know what that is, uh, a, a process by which you have two opposing, you can think of them as ideas or views of the world, and they're battling it out for a th- to become a third view, a third or an alternative me- um, approach or idea about y- the world or the way you are as a human, really. And that's what we're getting with this um, Songs of Innocence and Experience. Now, these two poems, Introduction to Songs of Experience and Earth's Answer, one, they have to go together. So they don't make much sense even together, but separate, they make even less sense. So they're very hard to understand separated and really, really hard to understand even together. But they become a little more clear when you read all of the songs of experience. And I think they become even clearer when you read all of the songs of innocence and songs of experience. So um, what I, I get this question now about writing, you know, high school or college kids or someone writing an essay. And if they choose William Blake and the songs of innocence and experience, one mistake that I see a lot is the idea of why doesn't this make sense? This poem and Blake in particular is a poet that you cannot take out of context He's an, a supreme artist, and his view is that these words and the images have to be taken together. So let me give you an example. When I read this poem in a few minutes, I'm going to read it. And if you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or go to TroubadourMag.com, you'll see what I'm talking about. I will have it on this white background uh, with black text. Hear the voice of the bard who present, past, and future sees, etc. I'll, I'll read later the whole poem. That is not, um, William Blake would probably be rolling in his grave if he knew that that's what I was doing. This is how he wants you to read it. Now, if you're listening and not watching, that's fine. Go to troubadourmag.com and I'll put the plates up on troubadourmag.com or you can Google them. You can Google the, the Songs of Innocence and Experience uh, William Blake's plates. But he actually drew these out and then put them on special plates that he invented to print them on this, this, you know, so what we're looking at, just so you know, is it's a, 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 a image, but it has a figure of a, it looks like a naked young man at the bottom laying kind of on a cloud, or he's on like some kind of furled bed on a cloud. 
and there are these stars. It's nighttime and he's looking up. It's like he's dreaming. And what he's dreaming is this poem. And it's, you know, in, um, you know, cursive here, the, the voice of the bard who present, past and future sees. And, it, you know, it's the song that he's dreaming up. Now, that, so that's what we're seeing here. And William Blake, he, like I said, he, he drew these out. He created these special plates to print them on. And then he would actually take, so he'd have this book of songs of innocence and experience that had all of this drawn out, but not colored. And then he would hand draw each and end of each individual book and then send it out to people. So you can imagine he was not the most popular because there's just not, he resisted the mass production of his work, which other artists like William Wordsworth, I talked about embraced. And I think it was to his detriment during his lifetime. Um, but he saw it as all a work of art, but this is, but the one thing you have to take with him is that he absolutely wanted you to see the totality. He wanted you to experience it the way he wanted you to experience it. And that is an artist. I think that is the, the consummate artist. You can't. So if you take the words out by themselves, you lose something, you lose something important. So let's talk about the actual poem itself a little bit. Um, and, and what we're, we're looking at. So I'm going to read the poem and we'll talk a little bit about it. Now I've explained that you can't take this out of context. And so I'm going to take it out of context right away. And we're going to just read it by itself with a you know black uh, text and white background, like I said, but we'll then go through it and kind of talk about it with earth. Uh, the next poem earth's answer. And you'll see why it's a kind of a call and answer type poem. And then we're going to talk more um, briefly about the series of songs of experience that I'll continue to read for your, hopefully your, your pleasure. And you'll see how these two poems kind of unlock and even shed light on or, or are shed light upon by later poems. And I'll talk a little bit about those as well. Okay. So let me read introduction to the songs of experience by William Blake. Hear the voice of the bard, who present, past, and future sees, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees. Calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen light renew. O earth, O earth, return! Arise from out the dewy grass. Night is worn, and the morn rises from the slumbrous mass. Turn away no more. Why wilt thou turn away the starry floor? The watery shore is given thee till the break of day. What? <laughs> what the heck was that? What's he talking about? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Let's see if we can do this to get it. So, um, hear the voice of the bard. So this is something that poets do a lot. Um, it reminds me of the variety of ways that poets have defined poetry or the poet's role. I believe it was, uh, Shelley who said that poets are the un- and unacknowledged legislators of the world. Homer thought of them as prophets and seers. And in his poetry, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, there are uh, bards. And especially in the Odyssey, there's a famous scene with a bard telling the tale of Troy and the fall of Troy as Odysseus is pretending to be just a random person and they're talking about his story and there's this uh, bard there that's kind of, and it, the bard is very, of course, respected in the story because it's written by a bard, right? Or it's at least uh, um, portrayed by a bard. And so they portray bards as very useful and important in society, which I think they are, but, you know, it makes sense that they would elevate that task. And it's um, also something that unites and reveals uh, us it's some in the story, a bard is the one who tells people what they need to think about something and how they need to think about it. And he kind of is a seer S E E R or a sage or a person who 
predicts the future. There's um, a view that is also in Shakespeare, when if you read many of his sonnets, he will often say something along the lines of, you know, my love, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, and you're going to (laughs) die, just like nature turns and everything turns around, but you'll become immortal because I wrote down words about you. (laughs) And here's a lot of poems by Shakespeare that has that kind of conceit to it. And now here's the irony, of course. He was right, right? So that's the other thing is there is is this uh, theory of like who is William Shakespeare writing about? And she is in a sense immortalized. Edgar Allan Poe immortalized, um, you know, women like Eleanor. And you have immortalizations of People, like I said, um, you have Odysseus, you have Achilles. I mean, would we know about Achilles without Homer, without the poet, the prophet? And so there's been this theory for thousands of years that you need both the man of action and the man of the word together. And they they kind of build each other up in a sense. And so this is this speaking at least in the vein of calling forth or or it's called in the technical term is an invocation poem invoking something homer in um in the iliad and in the odyssey begins essentially by saying sing to me o muse sing to me o goddess and what he's doing there is he's invoking the power of the muses and if you think about the tradition of an oral tradition that this comes out of the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and this is going to be important for William Blake because he's playing on that oral tradition that we know about when he, um, when, when Homer is writing this, we do know that he's writing based on, um, an oral tradition of telling this story of the fall of Troy. And he's, you know, for the first time they're writing it down, but it's been around for a long, long time. And so there is this beginning tradition of like, think of it as like an athlete who, you know, sits down and prays for a good game, right? Or a singer who crosses himself before he goes on stage to sing uh, the national anthem to the whole world, right? Like at a, at a football game, uh, halftime or, or, you know, someone who does something similar, does a show at the Olympics and there's like a million people, millions of people watching, right. They might sign themselves or say, please God, give me strength, right. To not mess this up. And that is essentially what the oral tradition bards would do is they would say, sing to me, O goddess, sing to me, O muse, and you know, give me power, sing to me, give me this story. And they would say something like sing to me, O, o muse, of the man of twists and turns. And then he would go on to this whole epic story that would take sometimes you know hours and hours and it'd probably be done over two days. And it would uh, be the tale of Odysseus, right? The man of twists and turns, the man who was able to use his mind to get out of situations essentially and get into situations sometimes. And then how did he, got, he finagled his way out of it? So that is what this tradition is coming from. And it's an important part of this whole narrative songs of innocence and experience that you have that invoking of the muse and you know, the, the relationship between the man with the voice, the man of action, and particularly that invocation of giving me strength. Hear the voice of the bard. So I'm going to read the poem a little bit or we'll break it down here. H E A R. By the way, if you're listening hear, like hear it, hear the voice of the bard. He says, who present, past, and future sees, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees. So this bard that we're supposed to hear, right? So we're being admonished, we're being it's being invoked that we're going to hear someone who sees present, past, and future, whose ears have heard. So he's literally directly heard the holy word. So this is someone who's heard from God and heard, or at least from the man who walked among the ancient trees. Well, what are the ancient trees? They're just really old trees, maybe, or it's probably something related to the Garden of Eden, right? The first paradise on earth, the beginning of humanity where we actually communed with God. So there's that relationship between 
the ultimate source of something or of all of our knowledge, our understanding of the world, our experience in the world, and then the thing itself. And in the ancient times, in Adam and Eve's time, they directly just talked to God. They didn't inter have an intermediary. And we're going to talk about intermediaries in, um, in a lot of this with Songs of Innocence and Experience. And I've already talked about it quite a bit in other episodes. So we're being told to hear this, or we're going to hear the voice of the bard. Now, what are we hearing? Calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew. So what do we mean by lapsed soul? And one way to think about that, you know, a lapsed soul, a soul that has gone asunder, a sinner, right? This is a sinner. This is not a good person. This is someone who's lapsed. Something's gone wrong. Um, and you can think of it as a fallen soul. And weeping in the evening dew. This is something we saw a little bit in, in the Songs of Innocence, where you have this, um, you know, God who's who we think maybe doesn't do anything or care about us, but he weeps for us, right? And that's something that's a part of what he's, uh, William Blake is trying to uh, let us know that suffering maybe is part of the, the way that we're supposed to be, and God does care, but it's up to us to deal with it. Um, but he, he does believe in salvation. So we'll, we'll talk about that in later episodes, calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew. So now he's relating the evening dew. Now, I don't know how much they knew in 1794, but I imagine they knew a little bit. I mean, they obviously knew that dew came up at night, but one thing that happens is this is a condensation as the earth itself starts to kind of cool down and there's a kind of condensation. That's what dew comes from as far as I understand. Uh, as a non-scientist, and I'm dummy with this stuff, so please feel free to correct me. Um, but it, there is this phenomenon that we all have experienced where it's, you know, it could be perfectly dry out for the most part. Maybe it rained a day or two earlier. It could be perfectly dry out, and then all of a sudden you you go outside and you can feel wet grass, right? It's evening dew. It's like it came out, like it, it feels like it came out of nowhere, right? And you know, so one, this simple analogy is now we're personifying the earth because the earth is weeping, right? So the evening dew is now related to weeping. And that is a metaphor, by the way. Uh, now you may know that, that that's a metaphor, but it's sometimes these types of um, metaphors can slip by and we don't even really notice them. Calling the lap soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen, light renew. So we're getting a call. Now, what is the starry pole? We could think of this as metaphorically the poles of the earth, perhaps. And, you know, they're relating in, into the poles. Um, or it could be something else that we're not really familiar with. There's a lot of options here. And as we explore, I think we'll learn a little bit more. But we can tell and fall, like he's really stressing this fallen. Fall, when, when the poet repeats something, like that. It's not an accident. So unless you find out it is a printing error, then that's a, that's a problem. But he's stressing it here. This is not an accident and fallen, fallen, light, renew. Right? So he's stressing this fall, the lapsed soul, the sinner. You can think of, um, you know, reading Milton's Paradise Lost and the devil falling from earth. He was a fallen angel. and now, But now the question is we need to renew nature or, or uh, the light. We need salvation. We need to bring it back. So what's the next stanza? Well, it's a plea in a sense. O oh, earth, O oh, earth, return. Arise from out the dewy grass. Night is worn and the morn rises from the slumberous mass. So we have this bard that's praying and questioning us and telling, or telling the earth to come to our aid to help us renew Right? That's what the earth is supposed to do. It's supposed to renew. That's what spring is. It's a renewal. Turn away no more. So don't leave us. Right, This is the bard talking at this, by the way. Turn away no more. Why wilt thou, why wilt you turn away? The starry floor, the watery shore, and is given thee till the break of day. Right, So you have control. You have the ability to do something. So why are you leaving us high and dry. So this is the introduction to songs of experience. It is pretty vague, right? Because he just asked a couple questions. He has some interesting metaphors, but we don't know why they're there. We don't even know necessarily what they mean. 
especially by themselves. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is he talking about? Now, before we go into the next poem, I wanted to show you a quite a, a quick little reminder of the introduction to Songs of Innocence. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the whole poem again. You can go back to the Songs of Innocence, um, or I called it, it's also called The Piper. And first, I want you to look at the differences in, uh, so this is from the, this is right before the Songs of Innocence. And look at the, the tone, the coloring has changed, right? So obviously, and we'll get into that one in a second. Obviously, it's much darker. Now, this isn't a scary darkness necessarily, but it's definitely night. And you have this, this scene here. We have all these lambs in the background. This is from the Piper. You have this god, right? Some kind of being that's not human floating in the air, some kind of angel, right? You might even see a wisp of uh, wings back here. And then you have this Piper who's piping down the valley wild. Piping down the valley wild, piping songs of pleasant glee. On a cloud I saw a child, and he laughing said to me, Pipe a song about a lamb. So I piped with merry cheer. Piper piped that song again. So I piped, he wept to hear. Drop thy pipe, thy happy pipe. Sing thy songs of happy cheer. So I sung the same again, while he wept with joy to hear. Piper, sit thee down and write in a book that all may read. So he vanished from my sight, and I plucked a hollow reed. And I made a rural pen, and I stained the water clear. And I wrote my happy songs every child may joy to hear. So in the Songs of Innocence, we have this kind of pleasantry. Now, there is a weeping that's going on, but it's by the God. So I... You know, Piper Pipe, so the, the uh, Songs of Innocence introduction goes, Piping down the valleys wild, piping songs of pleasant glee, on a cloud I saw a child, and he laughing said to me. So I piped, he wept to hear, while he wept with joy too. So there isn't any weeping by the Piper, it's all by the God on a cloud, or the child in this case. But the child is, um, you know, on a cloud I saw a child. That's obviously some kind of angel or deity of some form. And the the ch- so if you think about like the going from the oral tradition into the uh, literary tradition, that's what this poem is all about. And that's what we get with stain the water clear, which I think is a really, really rich metaphor. And it has a lot to it because you're clarifying when you write something, but you're also staining it because you're losing that deep connection with the reality because um, you are, there is an intermediary. Right, so words are just black scratches, or in this case, yellowish scratches on a piece of paper, and they cannot convey. You know, I could draw a picture of, you know, or I could I could write a story about this wonderful uh, feast of food, but that's not the same thing as eating the food, right? It's, they're two different things, and the the eating or the writing of the feast of food may be very clarifying. It may you know paint a picture that's really beautiful. Same thing with like a painting of a beautiful feast. It could look really great. It could do a lot for you, but you're still going to starve to death if you don't actually get the food, the nourishment. And that same type of thing is happening here. Now, the in this one, though, we have a, in the Songs of Experience introduction, we have a much more mature look, right? This person is now no longer just a piper, right? You could think of the piper as illiterate, just wandering down the valley wild. But now we have a piper that's literate, that's matured, that's civilized. And that's what we're going to get in the songs of experience. We have an adult piper now or a bard and the bard has more mastery over his craft. He's more purposeful. He's experienced and he is noticing the sin of the world, which we didn't notice directly. This is important in songs of innocence. We didn't quite notice the evils going on. So for instance, read many of the poems like, um, a cradle song, the chimney sweeper, a uh, little black boy, even the lamb and, uh, even the echoing green. And you'll often have these evil things like slavery interpreted through a child who doesn't understand what's going on. 
or the chimney sweeper where this horrible thing is happening to these little boys, but it's through the eyes of the little boys. And so they don't know that it's evil. But now we're getting this more mature. And, and by the way, as the Songs of Innocence progresses, pr- progresses, you see a little bit of this understanding that these lapsed souls are happening. And there's a questioning of why God, why deity, why you know a Christian benevolent God are you letting these souls lapse? And then in the Songs of Experience, you're going to have a direct assault at what's going on and what Blake thinks is actually going on. Okay, so the next one I'm going to read is Earth's Answer. So this is what you're looking at. Again, if it's uh, Songs of Innocence, or excuse, ah. <laughs> if you're listening rather than um, re, uh, th- rather than watching on YouTube or Facebook or TubadorMag.com, I'll put the uh, plate on Troubadour Mag so you can look at it. But this is really a helpful t- um, poem to read in conjunction with the uh, introduction because again we have an invocation a call now we have an answer and when you think about the two contrary states of the human soul often you see these kinds of pairings all the time sometimes you see pairings that are there's one you know in songs of innocence and then there's a pair in songs of experience so you have the lamb in the songs of innocence and the tiger, my favorite or one of my favorites, probably my top, uh, maybe number one or two. They fluctuate depending on my mood in uh, songs of experience. Okay. So let's just go through this and I'm going to read it first and then we'll go through it and it'll, it'll hopefully shed a little bit of light on this. And remember when I read this, this is earth's answer to what, to the call that was just happening. So what was the call? What were they asking? They were saying the bard was decrying, hey, why are these lap souls? There's these lap souls happening. They've fallen. Oh, earth, oh, earth, return to us. Do something about this. Rise from the slumberous mass. Turn away no more. Why will you turn away? The starry floor, the, the watery shore is given thee the break of day. Stop turning away from us. We need you. So here's earth's answer. Earth raised up her head from the darkness dread and drear. Her light fled, stony dread, and her locks covered with gray despair. Prisoned on watery shore, starry jealousy does keep my den, cold and hoar, weeping, or I hear the father of the ancient men. Selfish father of men, cruel, jealous, Selfish fear can delight, chained in night, the virgins of youth in mourning bear. Does spring hide its joy when buds and blossoms grow? Does the sour sow by night, or the plowman and darkness plow? Break this heavy chain that does freeze my bones around, selfish bane, eternal bane that free love with bondage bound. It probably, I mean, I definitely tried to make it sound, you know, a little bit darker, but I think any interpretation is that this is darker than the songs of innocence in, in a literal sense. And in fact, he even has, you know, here's a word we've used before, alliteration, darkness, dread, and drear. It's kind of the repeating of the first consonant there. D, d, and yes, it is just the D sound, but it what it does to the ear, Earth's, Earth raised up her head, if you're really paying attention, a Earth raised up her head from the darkness, dread, and drear. And you have the dr, dr is particularly dread and drear. You know, that really puts the sound and the meaning in your head longer and it pounds away at your sound, at your head a little bit. And what I think that does is it emphasizes this element of darkness and that it's a scary kind of darkness. It's not just any kind of darkness. It's dread and drear. It's a bad thing. So we have this earth rising up her head from the darkness, dread and drear. Her stone, her light fled, right? So light has evaporated from everything. Stony dread. There's that word again. And her locks covered with gray despair, right? Her, her hair 
has gray despair. She's kind of gr- matured and she has these ha- this hair of gray. Now she, she kind of is going to talk here. Prisoned on a watery shore. Starry jealousy does keep my den. So her den, the place she lives in, what, what's going on? Why is she um, you know, away from everything? Because she's been imprisoned on a watery shore. Cold and whore. H-O-A-R, like whore white. Weeping over, I hear the father of the ancient men. So basically she's been imprisoned in her little t- den. And if you think of land as being imprisoned by ocean, that's one way to look at Earth's answer is, you know, that we have this powerful ocean that's burning it, you know, or, or blocking in the the land. And she's just sitting there weeping, which is the evening dew, right? Hearing, and I hear the father of the ancient man. So the earth has a connection to that God that we talked about from the, from the ancient trees that the bard has lost. So if you think about the piper, the piper has a direct connection to God. The, um, the bard does not. The bard has an intermediary in it. Now we're in this tradition of writers writing from the works of writers before. We learn how to read and write from writers who came before, and we no longer we're so we're further and further uh, disconnected from that original person or people, Adam and Eve, who talked directly to God, or just like that piper. But the earth isn't disconnected. The earth hears the father of the ancient men, selfish father of men, cruel, jealous, selfish fear, can delight chained in night, the virgin, virgins of youth and morning bear. So there's a deep question that's not answered here, I don't think. Like, I have my views because I've read Songs of Innocence and Experience, so this is somewhat, I'm trying not to spoil too much of it. But she's she's referring to two different fathers. And if you want to look at other poems I've done, you can look at, um, because fathers come up a couple times in Songs of Innocence, like The Chimney Sweeper, where the father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 like a little bird. And then we have little boy lost and little boy found where the little boy is lost because he can't find his father, but he's found by the God, right? The little boy lost in the lonely fen led by the wandering light began to cry, but God ever nigh near, but God ever near appeared like, like his father in white. And we have this even with uh, further in the chimney sweeper um, where, you know, God has kind of a, Feel it like gives the boy a feeling of reassurance. Now, here we have, you know, possibly two different gods. Right? I hear the father of the ancient men. And then, but then since then, there are these selfish father of men, cruel, jealous, selfish fear, can delight. So if we, we put these together with maybe the original father was selfish too. Maybe there was something wrong with the original father, the ancient father. You know, maybe this is a problem with God that this poet is struggling with selfish father because he's imprisoned her earth if you personify earth earth is talking right now so we've imprisoned earth selfish father of men cruel jealous selfish fear candlelight chained in night the virgins of youth and morning bear so they can delight they can enjoy it but they're chained in night they're chained in darkness and experience and bad things they don't get to enjoy fun. And here's a, a series of rhetorical questions. And the answer is no to all of them. Does the spring hide its joy when buds and blossoms grow? No. The spring does not hide its joy. Does the sower? No. Sow by night? No. Sower does not sow by night. Not, I imagine they don't talk about sowing needle. I think they're meaning sowing in the field um, as, a, as a farmer. I don't know much about farming, but I imagine farming at night is probably not the, with no lights, is probably not a good idea. Or the plow, plowman in darkness plow, again, you don't want to plow at night, probably hurt yourself or somebody else. So the, the series of rhetorical questions, the answer to them is no, they don't. It's, it's asking this question, does this person do this? You know, do, uh, I mean, you might have heard some kind of rhetorical question that goes along the lines, you know, do lions roar? I mean, you know, so it's a rhetorical question when someone asks something and you say, does this thing do that, right? Do, do ships float? Like, 
Yeah, obviously. And that's a rhetorical question here. So does spring hide its joy when buds and blossoms grow? No, it doesn't you know, do that. So why can't, um, when we talk about selfish and, and cruel things, you know, why is this happening? And then the last stanza, I think, reveals why those rhetorical questions were asked. Because the earth is not going to ask something of us. Break this heavy chain that does freeze my bones around selfish vein, eternal bane that free love with bondage bound. So she is asking that's earth is asking us humans to free her. And it's up to us to do that. Now, how do we do that? I mean, that free love with bondage bound, we don't really know. We are going to get an indication of what Blake will suggest as part of the problem, but we do know that there is this oppressive thing that's chaining and locking Earth in, and that's getting us farther away from uh, the renewal of light, which is what we want, right? We, because we're lapsed souls, we're sinners, we're fallen, and we want to come back to the light, but we need Earth's help for that. In order to do that, we need to do something with our civilization. Okay, so that's the Songs of Experience introduction and Earth's answer. Now, as I said, as you go through it, if you follow along troubadourmag.com, I'll continue to go through these poem by poem. Some of them I might do more than one poem, just like I did here. But I, I hope you're going to get, and you will get, a good understanding of the relationship between all of these poems, and that's very helpful for understanding the individual poems. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.